Greetings and welcome back for another session. In this session, we will be talking about the collectors, so solar thermal collectors. Uh, what I like to do when discussing the collectors is to break it down into the individual components. We're going to be focusing most of our time on flat plate collectors and evacuated tube collectors. We'll address a little bit about concentrated concentrating collectors as well. But with each of these collector types, we'll look at each of the individual components that make up the larger collector. We'll end by having a conversation about collector efficiency and performance and how to select the appropriate collectors for the appropriate type of system. These are our two main types, evacuated tube collectors and flat plates. And we're going to start off with flat plate collectors. I would say that flat plate collectors are a very proven technology. We have many of these system types and or this collector type that have been around for over 40 years that are still performing well and so we know and can predict basically how they're going to perform in the long term of the system they are also in many cases but not all repairable and serviceable which is always one of my favorite characteristics that i can pull the glass off remove some of the gasket and perhaps seal a leak if something ever happens they are also very competitively priced that we see. And in northern climates, we have a, some good performance with them shedding snow and ensuring that we've got great performance for all times in the year. Inside the collectors, we see that they are typically either in a manifold or serpentine configuration. And we'll look at what that looks like on the inside. Here's a great looking cutaway of all of the individual components that we see. The collector is typically made out of an extruded aluminum frame with an aluminum back sheet. And then we have a piece of tempered glass that is typically covering the front, normally something around a quarter inch thick, very heavy duty tempered glass. And then running through the sides and the back of the frame, we see insulation, which may be a fiberglass or rock wool or polyisocyanurate to insulate the back sides. We then have running through the collector some configuration of tubing. Uh, this particular one is a manifold configuration that you see the um, main header pipe running along the bottom. And then you have a series of riser tubes that pick up fluid as it goes along. This particular one has ports on both sides. We would normally introduce cold water into the bottom or cold fluid into the bottom where it picks up heat. And we would then pull it off on the opposite side to ensure consistent even flow. As a collector like this, multiple ones can be linked together by connecting the bottom and top ports to create a, a longer parallel manifold. You also see in this particular one that there is oftentimes vent plugs in the back of the sheets. The collectors, while they have a gasket and, the, and they are sealed, they're not designed to be under pressure. And so you need them to be able to balance with the atmospheric conditions. And so there are some vent and, and uh, kind of overpressure plugs that are going to be located in the back. Now, one of the things I want to clear up is how a collector actually performs. Now, oftentimes they're described as a thin, shallow greenhouse, and in many ways they're constructed in the same way, insulating the back and, and non-absorbing sides and then having a transparent glazing surface. The sunlight then passes through the glass and then strikes that piece of metal or that absorber plate where you're going to be collecting the solar energy. Now, a lot of people think that what happens is by creating a thin, shallow box that the air inside of the box gets very hot and then you take a fluid and you pass it through some hot air picking up heat and that is not actually the way that these systems work what's happening is that the fluid is passing through those pipes it's directly absorbing that solar radiation onto the metal and then conducting through that metal and heating up the fluid where it's then pumped away in many cases, the water coming or fluid coming off of the collector or out of the collector will be a higher temperature than the air inside of the collector. So while it does resemble a thin, shallow greenhouse, that's not really how it's working. And this is a great illustration of that. We see that the direct solar radiation, most of it passes through the glass. Some of it will be reflected. Most of the energy uh, is then absorbed by the absorber plate some of it of course is reflected or emitted back reflected off the absorber plate or emitted back off the absorber plate 
and then ideally we gain as much of that energy as possible. We do end up heating up that box a little bit and you will have these convective losses. The glass will absorb some of the energy and then convection or air blowing past will transfer some. Very little actually transfers through the back or the sides because those areas have been insulated. Now with flat plate collectors, there's two main configurations uh, of how we plumb together the pipes that are on the inside. The most common that we see uh, in US manufacturers is this manifold configuration where you have a header at the bottom, header at the top, and then we see these riser tubes. Typically attached to every one of those riser tubes is that shin thin sheet of metal, that um, copper sheet or sometimes aluminum sheet. And we'll discuss that in more detail later on. What this does is it does make it very simple for us to link multiple ones together and it does create multiple pathways. So we may come in with say a gallon per minute coming into the bottom of the collector and then in this particular case it gets split into six or seven or eight different um, riser tubes thereby slowing the fluid as it passes through each one of these. It's a shorter distance but you have a lower uh, fluid flow. We've got a lot less friction in this particular configuration because it's spreading it into multiple different pathways. The other type that we do see still is a serpentine configuration where you've got a single pathway running through the collector. The more common with European manufacturers, we don't see a lot of this from US manufacturers of collectors. A single pathway means that you tend to have a higher temperature rise which, with a little bit lower flow. So not as many gallons per minute, but a higher temperature increase um, and a single pathway. Since you have a single pathway that's passing through there, it goes this way and that way and that way and that, um, you tend to have a greater friction head at the higher velocities. Now, one of the key components and the real workhorse of the collector will be the absorber plate. It's what's going to be converting that light energy into heat energy. It's a directly absorbing the solar radiation and then conducting it along the metal surface until it heats up the fluid inside of that. Because it has to be a good conductor, well, we're pretty much going to be limited to copper or aluminum. Most uh, historically, we're all made of copper because they were going to be soldered in some way to the copper riser tubes that were passing through there. But we're seeing a lot more manufacturers make them out of aluminum because we're laser welding the absorber plate onto that riser tube. We need to make sure that we've got good contact between the tube and the absorber plate. This particular one here shows one that's fully formed around the riser tube. Um, a lot of them are just a single sheet, um, uh, a single sheet with the riser tube attached to it. And I'll kind of draw one, um, oops, draw one here, where it's just an individual sheet and then the riser tube is attached underneath. Now that little bit of surface area right there and contact generally is going to be sufficient enough to transfer that heat as long as it's continuous along that spine of the of the absorber plate. So if we have the tube that's passing through there, if you were to just to go along and spot weld it and tack it on, you would create too much of a bottleneck through there that you wouldn't get good heat transfer. But if it's welded all the way along the spine like this, then that's generally going to be sufficient. And we see a lot of uh, manufacturers that are Place like that. There are, of course, a lot of different configurations that we see within of in those. This is an example of one of those unglazed pool collectors, basically made out of plastic that doesn't have the frame. Standard ones look like this. They do have other ones that limit convection. We've seen a couple that have either a double pane of glass or have a thin film. Um, this one is using a form of a polycarbonate. This one, they tried to pull a vacuum on the inside, and that's not really done so much anymore. Um, we're still uh, sticking with this kind of st standard flat plate collector design. The rest of these are still very rare and, and very infrequently used. 
These slides I've, I put in there just because I think they're fun to look at. These are some past configurations of absorber plates. There were a lot of attempts to try to figure out how to use steel or how to use aluminum before we really settled on sticking with copper. This was kind of a, a, roll, form, uh, a roll form style. Here they were trying to use a copper uh, a copper tubing with aluminum plates that were joined together. So not so much of those are used anymore. Equally as important as what the absorber plate is made of is how we choose to coat it. And we use some selective coating, some specifically engineered products that are very good at absorbing most of the radiation spectrum of this of that of the solar radiation and are also very good at not emitting that heat back up. So we really categorize how absorbing coating will perform based on the absorptivity and the emissivity. And the absorptivity is the percentage of the solar radiation that it will absorb. So you may hear sometimes manufacturers will say, our collectors are 95% efficient. And what they're really saying is that our solar absorber will absorb 95% of the solar radiation. However, any surface that is basically black is really good at absorbing solar radiation. However, some of them will emit that right back out as shortly after it's absorbed. So if you just take a can of black spray paint and spray that um, over a, a sheet of metal, really good at absorbing, but it's gonna emit back a lot of that radiation. And that's what we see here. So I've got a copper plate, um, not so good at absorbing, it reflects a bunch of it. I paint it black, it's going to absorb more, but this red line is the radiation that comes back out. So we start to use some of these other coatings. One of the first ones was to chrome the surface. We're not using that so much anymore. Now we're using this, this tinox version, which is a titanium, nitrogen, and, and, uh, and oxygen. So we look at these two categories and, and each absorbing coating will have the percentage that it absorbs and then the per percentage that it irradiates back out. And the net, the absorption minus the emission, is the actual solar radiation that is gained energy throughout the system. Um, and oftentimes this is done in multiple different layers. You will see multi-layer uh, absorbers that dielectric metal, dielectric, then it gets put over the substrate. We see enameling. We see some texturing to kind of minimize the irradiation or just having a, a specifically engineered paint, an intrinsic selective material that is going to be helpful as well. Some of our early methods were to just paint it black, and we had a lot of problems with the paint itself chipping off of the absorber plate and not absorbing as much as, as it possibly can. Then we started to chrome things or to have uh, selective absorbers. And so when we, you will hear this term say that it is a moderately selective absorber coating or a highly selective absorber coating, that's its ability to separate these two functions in order to maximize both of them. The two uh, fancier ones that we have today, one of them is PVD or physical vapor deposition. And I have this quote in here that I'm going to read. It's where an electron beam is directed onto a crucible containing coated material within a vacuum chamber. The material vaporizes and is deposited onto the copper while oxygen and nitrogen are introduced at low pressure into the evacuated chamber. Uh, this is oftentimes referred as tinox, and I just want to uh, show you the machine. Basically, you put it into this machine, and when it comes out, it's fancy. It generally has a blue sheen to it instead of an actual black sheen. So most of the absorber plates have this kind of blue shiny material. Another version is sputtering. This one takes place in a chamber with argon instead of a, a, a uh, instead of a vacuum chamber. But they're very similar in that this is what's happening. You have that substrate that you want to attach it to. You have the material you want it to go on to. And so what you do is you vaporize it and ionize it. And so this particular 
target uh, is ha has a certain charge. The material that's floating about there also has a certain charge. And then it will be a bombardment method where you see that they then grow or add on to that particular substrate. Now, most of this is going to be done in very controlled factory settings. So this isn't the sort of thing that, that you would do it yourself. Um, and most major uh, manufacturers of collectors are using one of these two methods. And oftentimes they'll even just buy the absorber plates with that uh, coating substrate on it. The end result is that we get an absorber coating that is somewhere between 90 to 95 percent effective at absorbing the solar radiation and then will emit back about 5 to 10 percent, which means that the current absorber coatings we have uh, under uh, standard test conditions will be around netting around 95 percent of the available solar radiation. That's of the absorber itself. So we can already collect most of everything that's falling on the collector. It's about minimizing the heat losses that we have within the collector, minimizing collective and uh, reflective losses from the glass. Okay, so that's the absorber uh, coating and the configuration on the inside. The next thing we want to talk about is how the frames are made. The most common one that we see is to make it out of extruded aluminum. And so here are a bunch of different examples of extruded aluminum. We use it in a lot of our racking. Uh, PV racking uses it all the time. And what you have is, is you have a uh, shape that is extruded into aluminum. So they have a cast and then they melt the aluminum and they push it through one of these dies, which is basically like a, a leg or not a, a, a Play-Doh press machine that we've all seen before. And it presses it out and then you have long stock lengths that are of these kind of unusual sizes. These are all used for framing, but you know, windows are made in the same way. And so we, we have this extrusion that has all these individual nooks and crannies that are used in the construction. What's unique about solar thermal collectors is that everybody's extrusion is going to be different. With PV modules, pretty standard sizes and depths that we see with a lot of those collectors. But with solar thermal collectors, because everyone's extrusions are different, they're made to that particular collector, all the mounting brackets and all those will be, will be custom to that particular collector brand. There are a couple other different ways to make that frame. I have seen uh, pan press methods where they take basically a, a sheet of stainless steel and put it in a press to create a bowl shape. I've also seen where they've used a roll form method where they take stock and then put it through a series of gradual rollers to bend it into a particular shape or configuration. Most of the frames that we use will be aluminum and they typically have an anodized coating. Uh, the anodized coating really helps it last a little bit longer and really protects it in marine and saltwater environments uh, a lot more than uh, some pretty other uh, other areas. I have seen collectors that do not have an anodized coating that have lasted for um, 35, 40 years. So we know that they can, they can last even without it, but not in marine environments that will eat right through the aluminum in, in a short period of time. We choose aluminum because it is, well, strong enough. It's also lightweight, relatively affordable, and corrosion resistant. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a good choice for making our collectors. Now the glass that we have, or the glazing that we see, is almost exclusively going to be made out of tempered glass. And the way that we make tempered glass is basically by baking it past 720 degrees. So we bake it and it hardens it, it solidifies the configurations of the molecules. It will uh, also make it very hard from the front and durable from the front, but very fragile from, from the ends. It makes it so sometimes when you're working with it, it can be very fickle. Um, We've seen, so I, I've seen someone that was carrying a piece of tempered glass 
They went to set it down on the grass and they set it down on, on a rock and basically it shattered into tiny pieces. When tempered glass breaks, it breaks into a bunch of small pieces, not into long skinny shards. So we'll see tempered glass also used in patio doors or in places that safety glass is going to be required. It also, like I said, makes it very durable from um, kind of brunt force collisions. It can bend quite a bit with, without breaking and in many cases can withstand hail. Um, it just really can't handle sharp edges. I always get this question about how well can it stand up to hail and uh, close to where my Mid-State Technical College is, there's a building that is owned by the state and they in 1982 put up 54 flat plate collectors using a tempered glass glazing and about eight years ago we had baseball sized baseball to softball sized hail what hit this building was baseball sized hail and it hit this collector array and out of those 54 collectors three of them did break their glass so the story is not that three of them broke glass but that 51 of them stood up to baseball sized hail and we've seen similar examples again the tempered glass can be fickle in all three of those collectors that broke however we were able to replace the glass and have them working in, in a very short period of time the tempered glass cannot be cut once it is tempered so sometimes getting replacement glass of a specific size can be a little pricey and a little bit uh, challenging the tempered glass that we use has a high transmittance uh, and it does that by having a very low iron content it, it prevents some from getting reflected we also will include dimples or etching and you see this kind of mirror this uh, textured glass here or etched glass right here and that's primarily to minimize glare so I don't have real shiny glare reflecting into any windows as kind of a nuisance sort of thing so it helps out with glare we also see that most manufacturers are now using a single pane of glass not a double pane of glass early methods tried to use a thermal pane two panes of glass that either are filled with argon or have a vacuum drawn in between them or uh, including you know multiple layers of glass even up to three layers of glass I i've seen before and what we see is that the minimal gains in added R values of a double pane are quickly lost by losing the additional transmittance. Uh, we use a low iron content glass that is about 90% transmittance. That only means only about 10% of it will be blocked. But when you start to add additional layers, you take another 10%, another 10%. And uh, they're just those gains just simply aren't recovered in the added R value of that glass because remember we're not trying to make a small hot greenhouse we are directly absorbing that that solar radiation the insulating material that we will put in here uh, we will see that it's either a fiberglass or rock wool or some sort of foam style sheets it, sometimes they will use a combination of both so we see foam in addition to some fiberglass that's there one of the key things that with any of these is that you don't want something that will off gas a lot or that has a lot of binders in it and so we're looking for things that can withstand the high heat without off gassing uh, problems. I know some collectors that were manufactured that did not have low binder or binder free type of uh, insulating material that off gas that formed a uh, kind of a, a nasty film on the underside of the glass. So it is kind of a critical thing. Now, if you're buying uh, collectors, of course, they're they're going to, to have that um, type of chemical composition. The two main foams that we see are this uh, polyisocyanurate, which is the foil face stuff with a foil facing the inside with the seams kind of taped to kind of isolate the foam from the rest of the collector. Um, the polyurethane sheets aren't used quite so much anymore. Some of them can kind of have problems over time with uh, too high a temperatures where they start to get a little bit rigid.
So we'll typically see one of these two, fiberglass or, or a poly, polyiso, um, or in some cases, the combination of them. The, the insulation typically isn't greater than an inch thick. A lot of people think that, oh, well, if one inch is good. I might as well put six inches, but there's a lot of diminishing returns. We're really just looking to provide a thermal break, not to create some sort of a super insulated container. Here's a good example of their ability to shed snow at, at high peaks. One of the things that will happen is because they will lose some heat through the glass is that uh, as soon as part of it opens up, you start to have heat that's being un released at the, at the lowest level of the snow, which gives it a little kind of like melting level uh, or layer, which causes it to slough off pretty well provided you don't have any obstructions below. No matter what type of collector you have, if, if there's a lip or another pitched roof underneath here, there will be some snow accumulation that happens at the, at the bottom of that. And, and this picture is just a, an excellent example of <laughs> good design and bad design happening at the same point. This was a, a custom made collector that was built specifically for this roof. And this roof was pitched to, to match this angle. And so we had the size and shape and everything worked out. And then the builder went ahead and put this little lip on there that acts as snow accumulator. Without that, it would have all sloughed off, but they, they didn't want it sloughing off onto, onto cars. Um, but then it all accumulates here and someone has to go out and rake it off uh, anyway. So it is something that we do want to be mindful of. All right, so that's flat plate collectors. The other key type is going to be evacuated tube collectors. Now, when you look at something like a flat plate collector, you can see that you can insulate the sides and the back, but you can't insulate the front. And a vacuum tube co collector can do just that. It is a tube that has been evacuated of all air, just like a vacuum thermos. Now, air is the means in which heat is lost through convective heat transfer. And by convection, we mean the transfer of heat through the movement of the matter itself typically something like air. I heat up air, the air then bounces around and, and, and that heat is then lost. If there's no air inside of it, there's no means for convective heat transfer. So you have something that is very well insulated, yet still transparent. We'll talk about the myriad of ways that these uh, evacuated tubes are manufactured, but almost all of them are going to be constructed out of a hardened glass, which is something like a borosilicate. We know it um, affectionately as, as Pyrex. Um, so it, it tends to not be as thick. It tends to be an eighth inch thick instead of a quarter inch thick. Um, and so their ability to withstand a heavy duty hail um, isn't quite there. However, they do have the advantage of, uh, if that hail hits this and you break a couple tubes, well, then you can just replace those individual tubes themselves. Um, I and myself, uh, our, I and my students have broken several tubes in the installation process. So it, it is something that we have to be mindful of when we're getting them up and down, down the roof. Um, there are some questions about shedding snow. If one of the collectors is mounted in this type of configuration, they actually shed snow quite well. At least that has been my experience as long as you don't have a buildup that's underneath. In northern climates where we do have significant snowfall, flush mounting this tight against the roof and not on a rack, I've seen a lot of those where snow gets packed into the crevices between the individual tubes. What you see in this picture here is we have this series of tubes and they're normally going to be around that six to seven feet long range and a number of individual tubes that are all connected to a single manifold. The fluid that we're going to heat enters in here, gets hot within that manifold and then comes out hot on the other end. Typically, there are some variations on that. We'll talk about these three main categories in which they vary. One is just simply the number of layers of glass it has. Some of them have two layers, some have one. The other is whether it has a heat pipe or not, and we'll define what that is, and then how this manifold itself up here is, con is configured. So this is what we typically see, series of tubes, and then an insulated copper manifold. Cold fluid enters in, picks up heat, comes out on the other end. The question then is how do I get the heat from down here to up here? 
most today, not all, there are some good ones that don't, use what's called a heat pipe. Early versions of the heat pipe simply used a solid copper rod, and as it got hot, it would conduct up, and then it would heat it up here. But they found that that wasn't a rapid enough method to get the heat from the bottom to the top. So most heat pipes are a hollow tube sealed on both ends that are filled with some sort of proprietary fluid. No one tells you what the fluid is on the inside, but I'm pretty sure that it's a combination of glycol and water mix. It, it, they tend to have some other additives that are on the inside. And as that fluid gets heated, and let me actually um, look at this one. As that fluid inside there gets heated, it will vaporize and the vapor will quickly rise to the top. You then have this condenser, this kind of like area that the tube gets bigger, and this is the part that's inside of the manifold. So it vaporizes, rises to the top very rapidly, transfers the heat through there in both sensible and latent means, and latent heat transfer is a very effective way to get a small volume to transfer a lot of uh, BTUs, because you're basically boiling this fluid and then you just bring a little bit of boiled fluid which then as it transfers the heat it then condenses and the liquid then falls back down to the bottom. Now some of these uh, heat pipes as is shown here with this Thermomax collector have a safety switch on the inside that when it gets up to 130 C um, which is over 300 degrees, then that uh, there's a disc on the inside, a, a snap disc or a temperature-based disc that will shut and prevent that heat from transferring. Um, most heat pipes don't have this kind of safety switch. They just have the, uh, you know, just a pipe filled full of fluid, a bigger bulge on the end that fits into the manifold itself. Now, so here we have that heat pipe, and it has the absorber plate that's going to be attached to that heat pipe or transferring heat to that heat pipe. The fluid then will rise up, and then it, it uh, is sticking into this manifold. Now, the fluid that you're trying to heat just runs along right next to that condenser, picks up the heat, and then uh, sends it on its way. So with the heat pipe design, the fluid that you're heating doesn't actually enter into the tubes itself. Um, and that was kind of the, the main strategy is that then you have a sealed line and it makes it a little bit easier to maintain that vacuum over time. You're not worried about that solar fluid freezing and bursting inside of the tubes or, or any of, the, any of those, those issues. The other version, instead of a heat pipe, is to have a direct flow design. And there's several versions of this. This one is showing a U-pipe design, and, and I've uh, put in one of these before, and, and, it, and it worked quite well. The fluid enters in, goes down one pipe, makes a U-turn, picks up heat, and then comes back along the other side. And then all of those pipes are connected into the manifold. So in that configuration, the fluid you're trying to heat enters into the tube itself, it just doesn't enter into the vacuum chamber, and we'll explain how that happens a little later on. The other version that we see is not a U-tube, it is a, a tube in a tube or a coaxial tube design. Little hard to see in this, uh, in this copy here, but the fluid comes down through a small inner tube and then bends around the outside of a larger diameter outer tube. So you're sending the fluid down through the inner one, and then it picks up heat as it comes back along through the outside. Okay, so first thing we talk about tubes is, does it have a direct flow design or does it have a heat pipe? The other is how many layers of glass it has. Now the original way in which these heat pipe, or these, uh, um, evacuated tubes were made is that you had a tube of glass and so think of just a long basic cup or a long glass and then you have either the heat pipe or the direct flow that's sticking out the end. Now I have a seal that I have to have a vacuum seal that's going to be metal, copper, some sort of a rubber or EPDM or, or silicone, really a silicone gasket and then a seal to connect all of these. This particular one is a hot press 
uh, stainless steel seal that's on there. Basically, they press it while the glass itself is still molten, sealing it on there. And the real concern with this is I have four different materials, glass and the silicone and the copper and then the stainless steel with all different expansion and contraction rates. And so we're creating something that is, is dealing with extreme temperatures, somewhere between negative 50 up to 300 plus degrees um, during stagnant conditions that we have to manage all of that huge range in temperature and all these different materials. And so some of them, there's a bunch of good ones that are out there, but some of them uh, during extreme contention, temperatures, it can cause that to lose the, the vacuum there itself. So many manufacturers are moving towards a double tube design where there are actually two layers of glass. And this picture shows a really good example of it. You have the outer layer of glass, which is then folded back onto itself and then an inner layer of glass. And you can see here another good example of that. And what it does is it creates a thin cavity in between those two layers of, of glass. That's an eighth to a quarter inch thick. And that is where the vacuum is actually made. So think of a long skinny tube that's round at the bottom that's placed inside of another slightly larger tube and then they seal this end along the outside. Okay. The real advantage of this is that you don't have a glass, metal, rubber, plastic connection. You don't have any of these materials. It's all glass and so it's all got the same expansion and contraction uh, rate. Um, this line that says less solar transmittance, um, a little bit of clarification there. The way that the that this works is the inner tube has the selective coating, which is oftentimes that tinox coating over top of a layer, a thin layer of aluminum, that is deposited on the outer side of the inner tube. So in other words, when the sun passes through this outer layer of glass it strikes that absorber plate and it heats that up the heat then has to conduct through the inner layer of glass so the absorber place is absorber plate is actually placed within the vacuum itself then you have to conduct through the glass the heat after being conducted through the glass heats up this aluminum heat fin um, of one version and then it transfers that heat to the heat pipe from the heat pipe you are vaporizing the fluid which will rise up to the condenser and then the fluid you're trying to heat passes next to this condenser uh, and then moves on its way they typically have a, a silicon or fiberglass or rock wool style gasket but this is just sealing up this so a bunch of stuff doesn't fall into there this isn't what's creating the vacuum. Remember, the vacuum is in between those two layers right there. Referred to as a Sydney tube or a Dewar tube or sometimes a double tube. And like I said, most manufacturers are moving towards this, uh, this style. The final distinction we have is whether we have a wet manifold or a dry manifold most of them are going to be a dry connection and what that means is if you pull the tube out of the manifold and pull that heat pipe out of the manifold water's not going to squirt everywhere this is a great picture of what's going on because you see that this manifold wraps around it here so if i were to pull that out that's a dry connection. We'll typically take a heat transfer paste, rub it on there before we stick it in there so that there's good a good contact. To maintain a seal between those two things is very difficult. So most are not a wet connection. And actually every evacuated tube that I've ever installed has been a dry connection, although I have seen some, some wet connection styles. One of the things that we also want to talk about is how that vacuum is obtained. 
This is showing, a, it's a great shot of what the end of one of these tubes looks like. You can see the inner tube as it comes along here. You can't see it because of that silvery shiny surface, but it bends around. And then there's some spacers that hold those two tubes down at the bottom so they're not banging into each other. A common place for these tubes to break is not down here, but actually up here. I saw a student that was holding it. He banged the rounded end uh, against the roof and it shattered up here because this is kind of where the weak spot is and so that's where where we had problems now what they'll do is they'll you know pull a vacuum and then they'll seal the glass down there but they'll leave inside what's called a getter normally it's this small barium disc and when you heat it up it will uh, chemically combine or really absorb any of the remaining trace gases that are in that vacuum space. So that's how they obtain uh, a highly effective vacuum, not by hooking up a vacuum to the tube and sucking as it goes along, but leaving something in there that will chem chemically combine with any trace gases. It's also what causes this uh, silvery, shiny spot down at the bottom. And this is our number one indicator as to whether we still have a vacuum because as soon as that vacuum is lost, um, the oxygen will overwhelm that getter and this will turn milky white uh, initially within minutes. It, it, it will quickly change color, but then you will also see that over time that will become clear. So if you can't see that shiny silvery spot, you've probably lost your vacuum. Now, quick fix, you're going to have to order a new or replacement tube and swap a couple out. I do want to talk about one other type of collectors uh, that is still on the market. They're not widely used, but they're, they're called concentrating collectors. Now, this is oftentimes referred to as, as concentrating solar power, and that's not what we're, what we're talking about. There are these large facilities, Nevada One, for instance, that is a concentrating system that has a big parabola that concentrates on a focal point or in some cases a power tower where a bunch of mirrors all shine to a focal point where you're creating extremely high temperatures think 600 700 degrees and those high temperatures are then used to generate electricity those we refer to as imaging or tracking type of collectors there are some residentially available concentrating collectors that use a non-imaging or non-tracking type of solution. And that's what you see here. Now, normally you have a parabola and that parabola will have a focal point somewhere in the middle. What this one does is it takes one parabola here and combines it with another parabola. And what that means is, what that means is that the focal point uh, moves toward the center area, allowing solar radiation to come in from any direction and still find that focal point. If you didn't have this double parabola, some things would come in and they would bounce straight out of here instead of finding their way back to this uh, uh, central point. So you will see these residentially. They tend to not have an absorber plate, just a absorber coated tube. Um, and they're generally not the, the most common choice, but I did have uh, some of these on a house that I owned once and they uh, seem to work perfectly well. Okay, now inevitably you're gonna be asking the question, uh, well, which collector is more efficient? And that's the question that uh, people ultimately ask. But before we can really answer that question, we really want to talk about some of the terms that are used when manufacturers and others will talk about efficiency. And they always talk about making sure that we're measuring the collectors appropriately. Because to look at efficiency, it's a very simple equation. Basically, we try to figure out uh, how much solar radiation the system produces, right? How much does it deliver is the other way to think of it. So we put production on top, right? And then underneath that, we try to figure out how much solar radiation is available, how much sunlight 
fell on that collector. So this is all the equation really is. Well, to figure out what our production is going to be, well, we monitor the output of the collector. So we measure the temperature going in, we measure the temperature going out, we measure how much flow is passing through there. We can say, okay, well, this thing produced 22,000 BTUs or something like that. The next thing that we do is we measure how much solar radiation fell on that collector in that same period of time. So we go out there with a light meter and we measure what the intensity of the sun is. But in order to figure out how much fell on that, we have to measure the area of the collector. And unfortunately, in this industry, everyone wants to measure collectors differently. Now, we have three ways in which it's measured. One is to measure the gross collector area. And this is the total area of the collector itself. So if we look at, let's just say, uh, this evacuated tube, the gross area, notice, is the whole thing. How big is that box that you have to put on your roof? So I think like to think of gross area as installed collector area because that's going to really determine how many of these types of collectors you can physically fit up on your roof. The other one is going to be aperture area and this is the amount that sun is actually passing through otherwise known as kind of the glass area and you can see here that there I have the glass area for potential collection and then the final one is the absorber area the difference that we see here, how much is actually collecting solar radiation. Now here's the challenge. If you're looking at the difference between an evacuated tube collector and, uh, and a flat plate collector, um, a flat plate collector, the absorber plate tends to go all the way to the frame, which is covering all of the glass. So a flat plate collector, the absorber area, the aperture area, and the gross collector area are all basically the same size. When we look at some of these other ones, like an evacuated tube, there's a big difference between the absorber area and the gross area because sunlight passes in between the tubes, the manifold isn't collecting any energy. So the question is, is well, what one do we put at the bottom of our equation? Um, if you are trying to make your collector seem like it performs better, then you try to use one that is like absorber area or aperture area. I always recommend that you consider gross area whenever you're looking at some of these efficiency calculations. The better place to actually get efficiency information is to go to the Solar Rating and Certification Corporation. And we'll discuss their data later on because that's where we'll actually get uh, performance to begin with. I tend to be a little bit skeptical um, when it comes to accepting the information provided by the manufacturers because they tend to want to obviously be selling me something. I will always <laughs> listen fully and appreciate what they have to say, but then I tend to get my data from an independent third party testing organization, and that's the SRCC, and that's the data that we're going to be looking at uh, in a second here. Now, the next question we look at is, well, is there a type of collector that is actually the most efficient? And I want to share with you uh, this graph right here, because that will really define uh, how we compare these two. Now, the graph has an easy y-axis. This is collector efficiency, efficiency percentage. This is the product of that equation that we just looked at. How much energy did it produce? how much was it available to it? Now, I use gross area. And the reason why I use gross area is because that's what the SRCC uses, but also because I'm an installer, right? I uh, have my NAPSEP certification and I install systems. And when I'm installing them, I'm concerned about the installed area. How many can I fit up on the roof? Not some academic term of the absorber area or what the potential is of that piece because I need the whole collector to really make that thing work. So this is collector efficiency percentage. And we can see that the collectors, it's dynamic. We, we're not always at 30% or 50 or 70%. It changes quite dramatically based on the conditions in which the system is working and the outdoor conditions in which it's collecting. Now, what about 
this x-axis. This one's a little bit harder to define. And this is the collector inlet temperature above ambient temperature. Now that's a little bit uh, hard to, to describe. So we'll, um, if we've got a collector, right? And coming off of it, we have a heat exchanger that dumps into a tank and then it returns back. So here's our collector and our basic solar loop that we have here, <laughs> scrappily drawn. And what we'll see is we'll have collector hot fluid going out and cold fluid going back in. The fluid going back in, we refer to that as TI or inlet temperature. And inlet temperature will actually very coarsely, closely correspond to the temperature that we're experiencing in our tank. In other words, the hotter the tank that we have, the hotter the inlet temperature, because what's coming out of this heat exchanger should be very close to the temperature in that tank. In other words, it kind of corresponds to the thing we're trying to heat. So for instance, if we're trying to heat up a pool, like an outdoor seasonal pool, my tank is 80 degrees, so my inlet temperature tends to be 80 degrees. If we're looking at some high temperature type applications, like let's say that I'm trying to do solar cooling. And yes, we can cool, create cool with hot by using uh, different types of, of uh, chillers, uh, absorption chillers, adsorption chillers, but we need like 250 degrees. So in that range, TI or the temperature of my tank is 200 to 250 degrees. Now, typically, if we're heating domestic hot water, that number is somewhere between 80 and 120 degrees. The typical range of my tank, somewhere between 80 to 120. So my inlet temperature tends to be within those. But the most common one that I see with that inlet temperature being really 90 to 110, most common to be in that, in that range. Now, so that's collector inlet temperature. That's his first part. The other thing is TA or ambient temperature. In other words, how cold is it outside? The colder it is outside, the less efficient my collector will be. And that's intuitive, right? It's very cold outside. More heat will be lost through the insulation, through convective and conduction, all these things. So the colder it is outside, the less efficient it is. So this down here is actually TI minus TA. That's what we're looking at at that bottom X axis. So the higher the inlet temperature, the further along I go this way. Or the bigger number I'm subtracting from it, right? Uh, the higher the ambient temperature, the further along I go this way. If this number is very small, then I stay over here. In other words, the colder it is, the less efficient I become. Now, both of those things are obviously intuitive. So let's look at this, uh, some of this data. Now, I pulled this data from the top 10 manufacturers of flat plate collectors, evacuated tube collectors, and pool collectors, and I kind of averaged it together. Now, that's it, it's really for the purpose to create this graph, but it's not really the, the best idea because there is a huge variations between evacuated tube collectors between you know so there's also huge variation between flat plate collectors there are are some that have dramatically different curves but on the whole this gives us some general shape of their performance the other one that we have on there is that pool collector right that unglazed basically it's made out of plastic it's just a, a bunch of tubes that are connected together we take the pool water chlorinated pool water, send it right through this piece of plastic and it gets hot. It's basically a glorified garden hose. And so what we see is that the collector that can achieve the highest efficiency is actually a pool collector. Now let's look into this a little bit more. Now it is near 100% efficient when it is, when there, when it, there is a difference of negative 10 here. In other words, let's say that the inlet temperature is 80 degrees and it is 90 degrees outside. It is actually warmer outside than the pool water. That is a scenario that would give me a negative 10 Ti minus Ta. That would put us right here. Now, with this percentage here, 
is how much is being put out versus how much is actually falling on it. And it's not that you're actually collecting 100% of the solar energy, is that you're actually getting some inputs from ambient temperatures. Imagine that you took 80 degree water and spread it out on a thin mat and then put it into a 90 degree oven. It's gonna pick up some heat no matter what. However, if you put it inside that 90 degree oven but surrounded it with a perfect vacuum, a great insulator, it's not gonna pick up any of that. So we look at these three collectors and in that scenario, the most efficient collector during that condition is actually a pool collector. Now this always shocks my students that a glorified garden hose will outperform an evacuated tube collector that has a vacuum surrounding it, minimizing heat loss. So it really depends on what you're trying to do and what the conditions are. Now, these plastic pool collectors are only used for outdoor seasonal pools and typically just in warm climates, although you can do it for a, a summer use application. My students and I just installed some of these unglazed pool collectors here in Wisconsin and they're you know, uh, out there working exceptionally well during the summer months, extending that uh, swimming season that they have. So that's really the best choice when this number is very small. As soon as it gets cold outside, notice that we move along this way and the efficiency plummets. When it's really cold or you're trying to heat hot fluid, their efficiency quickly goes to almost nothing. So again, it depends on what you're trying to do. So when we are trying to heat domestic hot water, it's interesting because our range is normally somewhere between here and here. So there are some conditions that flat plate collectors will be more efficient. There are other conditions that evacuated tube collectors are more efficient. So uh, it really depends on what the conditions are outside. The other thing is that the conditions will change throughout the day. I mean, let's say it's, it's 40 degrees outside and your tank starts off at 50 degrees. It's fully cold. Well, throughout the day, if the outside temperature stays at 40 degrees, which it's not going to, it's going to fluctuate, but let's say it stays at 40, your tank temperature will increase and you will find your way moving down along this line. And as your tank gets hotter and hotter, your collector becomes less efficient throughout the day. It's for this reason that we try to encourage a a system that allows you to have a relatively low tank temperature and try to get the return temperature going back up to the collector uh, as cool as possible because it maximizes our efficiency. Now, the only way to do that is to make sure that you only need 120 degrees. That's why we start to drop an efficiency when we're trying to heat stuff up to 180 or, or higher. Now, there are some things that we do see when it is really cold outside, evacuated tube collectors will outperform flat plate collectors. And we hear this a lot. And that is absolutely true. But that difference is about 5%. It's, it's not an overwhelming difference during those really cold conditions that it's really not even worth talking about the difference between them. My sentiment on, on this is that if we're trying to heat an outdoor seasonal pool, Let's use an outdoor seasonal pool collector. If we're doing domestic hot water or relatively low temperature space heating, both flat plate and evacuated tube collectors are excellent choices. They are both proven. They will both uh, work well and deliver meaningful and substantial heat. My choice when I'm picking collectors for my own house or for my clients is actually not on this efficiency curve. Most high quality collectors are very comparable in their efficiency anyways. I look to a couple other factors. First of all is cost. The first collectors that I put on my house were definitely not top of the line, the highest efficiency collectors, but they were much more affordable. They were still well built and looked like they were durable and long lasting collectors and, and have proven to be so, but they just weren't the most efficient, but they were significantly cheaper. So instead of putting up two, I was able to put up three collectors, got more performance and still ended up spending less money. So cost is something we of course certainly want to consider, but we can't really evaluate the cost until we look at their efficiency comparisons. For me, more important than efficiency is always going to be durability. I can see 
40 year old collectors that are performing well. So longevity is really about it. A lot of our systems uh, don't hit that payoff date till the five to, to 10 year range or some cases 15 years. So our number one goal is make them last 40 years. Then we know it's going to be an exceptional investment. Um, I pr also prefer to buy local and there are a lot of uh, local manufacturers no matter where you live in the world um, and so I would look to those look to those first here's another way that we can uh, look at this this one is is from the one of the Kalefi manuals um, of the combination of all these things so we can look at it in a bunch of different conditions I looked at it in some average conditions and I got my number from the SRCC so in order to get any United States federal tax credits you have to buy collectors that have been certified and the most common certification is the Solar Rating and Certification Corporation. And every collector will have a, uh, a sticker on it uh, that looks basically like this. There's some very specific requirements about how these stickers look and where they can, can be placed. And they need to be placed on every single collector. The way that SRCC gets their performance data is through a testing equipment that looks like this, not like this. And that's an important distinction. This is a kind of real world test. You stick it outside and then you data log it and you measure the solar radiation and the performance. Um, that's not what the SRCC is doing. They're testing it under some very specific conditions. So they tend to be not using natural sunlight. They're using artificial um, full spectrum lamps that are shining down on it. And then they're carefully monitoring the inlet temperature to provide a consistent inlet temperature, measuring the outlet temperature and looking at, at the, the performance therein. So it's standardized conditions. So we're really getting apples to apples to apples for every single collector that's out there. They not only will look at the collector performance and publish data on that, but they also have some other standards um, the, you tend to send them several collectors and they randomly select one of them. They inspect it uh, upon receiving. They do a static pressure test. They do a shock test where they get it hot and then get it cold a little bit. And then they also do the thermal performance test. The SRCC has two forms of, of certification. The first is the OG100, and that's what we see here, the OG operational guidelines 100 is for collectors they also do one that is the og 300 that is for full systems that's collector tank pump and every single com component and so you can get some standardized performance for a full package style system in terms of what the output looks like, this is what you get from the data sheet. This is the top and this is the bottom. And we've got a couple different types that we see here. This one is a evacuated tube collector that we see. And uh, what you have here is you have, at first, it tells you what type of uh, certification it is, OG100. It tells you who it is, what model number, the, the collector type, and then the certification number and all that kind of details are up there and then you have two tables that are identical but one is in metric one is in imperial units so we're going to look at this one uh, because around here we use BTUs and, uh, instead of joules so we see these different categories uh, in terms of rows and these three different columns so when they test it they test it for clear day mildly cloudy day and cloudy day and that is the number of BTU per square foot per day. So you look at 2000 BTUs, units of energy, fell on one square foot uh, for the entire day. And because of that number, it's really important to know how many square feet you have. And that's why we spent so much time talking about what's the appropriate way to measure it. Um, when they're doing these calculations, that's based on gross area. So we see, here's one of those conditions when it is negative nine, and it is a clear day, this thing will produce 31,000 BTUs per panel. So that way we receive thousands of BTUs per panel per day under clear day conditions. If it's a mildly cloudy day, then it drops down to 23,000 BTUs. Um, and, uh, and then if it's a, a cloudy day, it drops down to 16,000 uh, BTUs. Typically, we can see that 
uh, we look at here, you cut the solar radiation in half and the output is cut in half, but that's not always the case when it's really cold outside. We look at one of these conditions, this is where it would be really cold, and it drops to uh, even uh, less than half, it drops to basically a third of it um, when you're in, under, under cloudy day conditions. So that's what each of these columns are for. And here we have the data that's on the inside. And then we have these categories. And they define these categories down here. And I'm not wild about those categories because it says here's pool heating in a warm climate, pool heating in a cool climate, uh, water heating in a warm climate, water heating in a cool climate, and then air conditioning. And so uh, I'm currently in a cool climate, central Wisconsin, and water heating. And so that means that I should use this 90 degree uh, TI minus TA. But the problem is, is that this ranges throughout the season and throughout the day. There are some times that I'm here. There's some times that I'm here. So you're not really fixed in one of these conditions. Plus, if I live in a cool climate, I have many warm days, you know, six months out of the year, I'm in this category in this category, the other six I'm in this category, and sometimes even as far as, far as that category on really cold days. So it's not this sort of static thing where you just look at the table, you pick the particular box, and you say, okay, I will get 16,000 BTUs. However, it is effective when comparing collectors from one to another. One of the things that is uh, on our online program is a calculator that you can type in several different collector types. You type in the data from the, this SRCC output and it will put together a nice looking graph like this so you can compare a couple of collectors in terms of what their performance is going to be um, based on calculating their efficiency. So we've tried to make that a little bit easier for you. Other things that you see in the SRCC data sheets will be the uh, you know gross area and the net aperture area. So the size of the frame on the outside, the size of the glass, but also the dry weight, um, what they tested the pressure up to be and the fluid capacity. And so if we look at something like this, this is a, a four by eight flat plate collector, weighs 126 pounds and holds 1.1 gallon of fluid. The, oftentimes this is a little bit incorrect for some of these evacuated tube collectors it still says zero gallons because you're not putting any gallons into the uh, heat pipe that you have uh, but a, a little bit of fluid will still be held in the manifold the bottom of the data sheet looks like this and here you've got some specifics about the collector material. So what's the frame made out of? What's the cover? Well, it's a glass vacuum tube. You can see the absorber coating is a sputtered aluminum nitride. So it's going to be one of those blue types of coatings. Um, and you can actually look, instead of looking at that individual output, so here's the, the efficiency uh, equation, the slope and the intercept, the intercept that you can look at some of those. And you'll also see some pressure drop. Uh, in inches if you want to look at the pressure drop at a variety of different gallons per minute through that particular collector. So it's a great source to look at uh, comparing the output and performance for each of these collectors. So to sum up, we looked at um, the different types of collectors that are out there, the individual components, the characteristics of each of them and their applications, and then the methods that we use to evaluate. Efficiency just being one of them, but how do we find the information from the SRC and interpret it to make informed decisions about the quality and longevity of the collectors we're putting up? Well, that's it for today. I look forward to uh, our next uh, webinar. Thank you.